and uh, it's growing every year, and uh, we're super excited. The idea really is uh, to talk about you know uh, mistakes people make and uh, lessons that they've learned along the way. Uh, later on, uh, Guy Kawasaki is going to talk about this. But um, just to let you know, I don't know if you noticed, outside we have what I call the farmer's market for startups, um, about 40 companies that are demoing their products. So go check out what they're doing during the break. Um, and one of these minutes, we're going to get someone to help me out here. Oh, Angelica's here. Angelica, okay, Angelica's going to lead the next panel here. And yes. I'll get this out there of the way. There is no way I'm going to sit down on the floor. <laughs> so we got to move that. Just, just like, I'll just need to come but back. While we're waiting, uh -huh. I'll, I'll tweet everyone while we're waiting. The hashtag is StartupConf. In case you forget that, it's at the bottom of your program. I'm Angidi Kablenstrup, and I'm uh, recently started a uh, Latin American venture fund. We're also building a startup entrepreneurship program just for Latin Americans. So send them our way. And uh, Vivek, introduce yourself. Hi. I'm Vivek Wadwa. I read, write, I uh, create controversies, and That's I hang out with Angelica him. whenever I can. Hey, I'm Allison Johnston. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Instadio. Uh, we're the leading marketplace for online tutoring. You might already, your, your thing might already be working. Hi, I'm Sandy Miller. Is this working? Yep. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so I run Singularity University's Startup Accelerator, and I manage a, a very rapidly growing portfolio of about 25 startups at the moment. All right. Why don't we sit down? Do we have enough? If not, I'll stand. Yeah. We've got, we've got four. Oh, we have enough. We have four. I think grab that one. I'll grab this one. Perfect. So we're going to ask a couple of questions which I think will interest you from this panel. They are all very, very outspoken and sometimes known to be quite controversial for those of you who don't know Vivek. <laughs> Wrong panelist, so no. Poor Allison, she better do the same, right? Um, so my first question really is, I mean, the title is, I can do it too, and I know a lot of you are younger entrepreneurs. Can everyone really do it equally? If you say, you know, a lot of people say Silicon Valley, meritocracy, we can come here, we can start a startup, you know, can, we, can everyone really do it? Vivek, do you want to start off? We'll just do it the old fashioned way. The deck in Silicon Valley is highly rigged by the, uh, the powers that be. You have an elite crowd, typically the, um, the white boys from Stanford who drop out, and then you have a bunch of Indians and some Chinese, uh, mostly young male, who have the advantage. Everyone else is at a disadvantage. You don't fit the pattern, you don't fit the profile. They call it pattern recognition over here, which means that we're allowed, legally allowed to discriminate and, uh, uh, you know, and do things which are illegal. However, we put fancy words around it because we're part of Silicon Valley, we're above the law, we're above uh, you know, what's considered acceptable by uh, society because we're the tech guys and we can create so much value for society. So there's a, a system here which creates bias against uh, you know, the, the majority, basically. Uh, the minority really has uh, access to capital, they have access to funding, they have advantages which others don't. Now, that's the bad news, that's how it's been. But the good news is that uh, moving forward, the playing field is becoming highly level. The venture capital community, which I'm very critical about, um, <coughs> you know, used to be critical. If Silicon Valley, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, venture capitalists were the kings and kingmakers. When they came on stage, you would bow down. When they went to an event, everyone would huddle around them as if they were movie stars. Now, if you look at the dynamics, uh, no one gives a damn about venture capitalists because um, VC has become irrelevant. The angels have a lot more power right now, they're a lot more important because you need angel level capital to start a company. Moving forward, you won't even need that. You know, indeed, if you look at the cost of starting a company, uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you needed to buy expensive computers, which cost thousands of dollars. I remember when I started my first company, we set aside $10,000 per, uh, per uh, desktop. It recently, it was $5,000. Now it's a few hundred dollars and everyone has one. And then when it comes to um, uh, storage, we needed racks and racks of servers. Today you get cloud computing, you, you scale up as you go. So, and then if you're trying to build uh, world-changing hardware companies, sensor devices, they cost practically nothing. So the cost of, of doing? doing everything is wrapped exponentially. Awesome. So you can now have two kids literally in a garage 
doing a startup without raising venture capital. They just need enough food to be able to survive and a place where they can hang out. So the dynamics have changed. So now, out of the blue, you have companies like WhatsApp, who no one even heard of. If you look at Mary Maker's Internet Trends Report, which all the VCs you know, worship again, she didn't even mention WhatsApp in it. And six months later, along comes Facebook and buys the most, exp uh, most expensive acquisition ever of this company that, that was not even on the radar of Sand Hill Road. That's how much the world has changed. So getting back to your question, the, level, the playing field is not level. It has not been level. But moving forward, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyone in this room can create a world-changing company now. That's, that's the, uh, the magic of, of being in this era of innovation. So I'm not going to uh, ask everyone the same question, you know, one and then the next and the next, but please do, if you feel you have something important to say, chime in. Is your microphone working? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. So I actually disagree that it really comes down to this discrimination. I think that there's really two core problems for women and minorities outside of perhaps Asian minorities in Silicon Valley. I think one is just background. As women growing up, we were less exposed to technology. That's been a very kind of popular thing. Um, and that's something that we had to fight at the core. It's not that people are discriminating, for example, against women in technology. It's that fewer women want to get into it. There are fewer women who are qualified to be entrepreneurs, to be on boards, simply because they haven't had as much background. And that's something that's easily fixable, but it has to go back to when women are much younger. I think the second thing is just social groups. If you're a white male in his 20s in Silicon Valley, you're surrounded by a lot more white males that also are in tech, and you have that friend and that support group. If you're a minority, uh, be it ethnic or women, chances are fewer of your friends are in those groups. And that's just going to hold you back if you have fewer of those connections. So the biggest way to help people succeed is to help mix those groups, help women and minorities get involved in those. It's not something that is necessarily top down, but just what we're exposing ourselves to, both historically and now. Yeah, well, I, I don't agree with you that, um, is this on? Well, whatever, I don't really like it. I don't agree with you that people stay in their groups. If any, I mean, look at this. There are whites, blacks, pinks, greens, every country, every whatever. I think that's what makes Silicon Valley. People don't hang out white with white and, and Yeah, Indian but you're more Indian. likely to be friends with people who are similar to you. So for example, I have many more female friends than male friends, and that's just the way it's going to be. And yes, yeah. I have male friends, I have friends of all races, but you know, in general, people are, tend to be friends with people with more similarities to them. The age if, will change that. Yeah, <laughs> but, if, yeah but if you're not, if, you're, if your friends aren't in tech, you just have fewer of the support very groups. True. I've been very lucky where I a, actually have a decent number of male friends. I have a decent number of female friends with engineering backgrounds. And that's, I think, really helped me move forward. Mm -hmm. Alison, I got, to, I got to tell you that the majority of women I speak to don't have the advantages you have. Yeah. I agree. Right. And um, if you speak to them, they'll tell, you the horror, they'll tell you horror stories about how they've been treated, how they've been left out, just because they aren't really good looking or they happen to be dark skinned or any variety of factors and they're left out of the system. It's yes. a, it's, I mean, uh, it's not that simple. No, just you know, hang out with the right people and, and you're all set. It doesn't work like that. No, I mean, I agree. I think that one of the reasons I've gotten to where I am today is that I've had a lot of advantages that other women haven't had. You know, my mom's an engineer. I had an aunt growing up who is a serial entrepreneur. I went to Stanford, where I was surrounded by very supportive professors. I had a lot of those advantages. Stanford itself Huge gives advantage. you an unbelievable advantage that no one can overcome because it gives you a branding. Well, on this value. coast, when we're yeah. near Harvard, they don't like us. So <laughs> they're just jealous. Yeah. Sandy, you wanted to give yeah, some. Yeah, you know, there's there's sort of an, another interesting perspective to bring into this in terms of can anybody do it? Yeah. And and I think it's um, it's important to think about things beyond Silicon Valley um, uh, in particular because, you know, I, the accelerator that I run, I mean, Singularity has a, a global community, right? So we have people in over 80 countries, our alumni. And so with our accelerator, our, you know, all these startups, some of our startups are not located here. They're located in many different countries. And, and the thing that is fascinating is to see the role that Silicon Valley is playing for our entrepreneurs who, for a variety of reasons, are basing outside the US in their home countries and cities, but they are coming back and forth. Um, one of the things that's interesting about, about Silicon Valley is, is some of the reasons why they're coming back here. Um, uh, there are a few. It's, you know, they can be very cost efficient. Um, as we know, the, the cost of living here is very high, uh, and, and, and they're also picking places to live 
to the extent that they have that flexibility based on um, decisions around getting uh, talent that is much less expensive. Because we also, because of the cost of living, as you know, it, it, it follows that our, our workforce here is more expensive. And so there's um, uh, a pretty interesting phenomenon, and Annalise Saxenian, who wrote sort of the seminal book on uh, Silicon Valley called Regional Advantage. She's from Berkeley. Yeah, followed that up with something, and she calls these people new Argonauts. Um, but, and, and it is really interesting to see them coming back and forth and the reasons why they're coming here and even basing and, and forming you know, Delaware Corps for their US operations. So they're coming back here, no surprise, to raise money. Mm -hmm. They're also coming back here to do business with Silicon Valley law firms who are uniquely um, uh, dialed in to work with startup companies. And so the, the fact that um, you know, you can be almost anywhere um, and you're just, and, and these companies are optimizing based on what they need yeah. right now. And they are, what we're seeing are these companies that are incredibly mobile um, and fluid. And they may, you know, be outside the U.S. for the first couple of years as they're getting started, come back here, get that first seed funding, you know, prove the concept. And then they may ultimately move here as they're growing operations or not. Yeah. But they're picking that based on what that company needs yeah. at, at the point of, in time. Yeah. All right, another controversial question. Um, how important, now we all have degrees, we're Stanford, we all, we all have, have higher degrees here, but you know, there's been a lot of debate, especially with uh, Vivek and Peter Thiel. How important is it still for you all doing startups to have a formal education, to have graduated either from a prestigious university or have just finished a degree? Vivek? Prestigious universities don't count. I mean, it doesn't matter what school you graduate from. Okay. You need a basic level of education. You need to know the basics of finance, of management, you need to know how to motivate people, you need to know about the basics about ethics, and more importantly, you need to know how to interact with people. You need to know what's acceptable socially, what's not acceptable. You need to have been rejected. Those are the things which happen at college. So this debate about college, it's really not all about the degree or, or what course you take or what you learn there. It's more about the, you know, the spirit in which we get to uh, grow up and develop the social uh, uh, social sense that we would otherwise not have. So yes, there are some outliers, there are some people who have dropped out of college and become successful, and they, we tend to put them on a pedestal. But it, the, the data shows conclusively that having a degree makes a huge difference. In fact, the, uh, the earnings, the, uh, the number of employees hired by companies who are graduates in the tech sector, 45, 50% higher than those who don't have wow. similar degrees. So I didn't know it's that. A conclusive uh, uh, that the education provides an advantage. So when I debate Peter Thiel, um, uh, if you look at the Thiel Foundation, you know, this debate is going on, going on for four years right now. Years, yeah. He made a big deal about giving kids $100,000. He said that, look, they promised us flying cars. Instead, we got 140 characters. And um, uh, you know, we don't need to, these kids don't need to go to school. Look at what happened four years later. Complete disaster. Not one success coming out of uh, the Thiel Foundation. Thiel. Complete disaster. In fact, they ended up refocusing the Thiel Foundation. They, weren't, they didn't have the courage to say, hey, we screwed up over here. We were wrong, and we're pivoting. They quietly pivoted the organization, so now they're providing education. Now it's an alternative education. Yeah. So they're not, it's no longer about, hey, come here, we'll give you $100,000, and you can build right. uh, a world-changing app anymore. Now it's about, come here, we'll provide you an alternative form of education than what you have at, uh, at your university which is fine. When they take elite Stanford students and put them in a different uh, setting, those kids are already very smart. Yeah. They're selected. They will succeed almost anywhere, especially if you provide them the basics that they need. Yeah. Go ahead, Jenny. So um, I think that what Vivek summarizes is really relevant for what's happening right now in, in education. Um, I think for people, you know, how, raise your hand if you have a kid that's um, maybe starting, you know, uh, from just born to five years old. How many people have a kid? Okay. So do you, I mean, one of the things to realize is there's a high chance that the, the kid who's starting kindergarten, right, who started kindergarten this year, you know, will, will that kid get a bachelor's degree? Will that still be relevant? In a formal way. In a, in a formal way, right. What we think of as a typical right. four-year degree. There's a very good chance that that won't be the case. 
They will have AI tutors coaching them right. through who monitor their uh, their learning patterns and, and customize education for them. It's going to be a different era. Right, and and so them. so I think I think it's really important to think about the implications. I mean, think about hiring. Think about your what we screen for now, right? When we're looking at resumes and so forth, and how you how you you know stack that uh, when you're doing a search. It's it's really fundamentally going to change. Um, so that's one piece. The one thing that, that I would uh, follow up with, with Vivek's comment is, you know, I would sort of say it depends, right, in terms of education. And, and, and this is something that is going to be interesting to watch as we go forward because, you know, there are companies, startups, that need a very different sort of um, skills and, and are, are operating in the context of uh, vastly different uh, industry sectors with with really different dynamics. So you know, you look at the can tech, you give an example? Yeah, you I look was at vague. the tech sector versus anyone operating in a uh, life sciences uh, company in a you know in a, with a regulatory path, right? And and where the science you know when someone's having to when the technology for that company is basic science level, you know, frankly there are there are just some things that. Um, some experience that you really need, you know, at the bench, they say, you know, at the, at the bench, which is currently in a research institution. Can certainly also be in a, uh, in a like a pharma corporation that has those resources and, and can take the time to invest. Um, but at the moment, you know, there's just a certain set of skills that you just need some time uh, to, to get um, to do all these incredible things that are happening. However, uh, even as I say that, technology and the extent to which it is impacting how even basic science research in the, in the biological sciences, for example, is changing, certainly others, um, that, could, you know, that could start to, to even out as well. But I would say that that's sort of an area of an exception where you know, there's, there's something that's going to need to address that you know, even when our, our kindergartner is you know, looking uh, ready to, to look uh, to a career. Let me ask another question. So Vivek and I are both from overseas. I wasn't born here, he wasn't born here. How many of you are foreign born? <laughs> exactly. That's about two thirds of the audience, that's amazing. But that's what makes Silicon Valley so much fun. You know, people ask you, why do you want to live here? This is why. So the question I have, and maybe Allison, because you were born here, how much harder do you think is it to create a startup if you are from overseas, or how many advantages did you get? What do you see? <laughs> So I can't compare, obviously, because I wasn't born overseas. Um, you know, again, I think one of the biggest things is the sort of background that you had growing up. Again, I'll be the first to admit that I was very fortunate to grow up in a background where I was pushed in that way. I think that in some communities you see similar pushes, and in others you don't, or there are just other very important focuses that aren't tech or startups. So you're, it's really going to depend the background that you came from. I know you have strong opinions on that, too. Promised you controversy, right? <laughs> well, um, people born in the United States have an inherent, inherent advantage in that they know the culture. But people who come here from abroad are hungry. Are hungry. I mean, hungry, what happens yeah. is that you are the, uh, typically uh, the people who come here to study are middle class. We're not getting the, the absolute poor there. We're getting the, the most highly educated from abroad. They come here, they were at the uh, middle or top of the social ladder back home. They come over here and they're treated like shit. Basically, they're foreigners. They look different, they smell different, they dress different and they look down at. And they have this burning desire in their belly to rise, to get back to the level that they were at, and they work extremely hard. But who do you think looks down? Honestly, I've lived here since 1997. Angelica, Silicon I don't Valley see is a bubble. It's, it's, it's a, you know, if you go outside here, yeah. go to uh, uh, the south, you'll, you'll, you'll know. I mean, you're a white woman, so you don't see it. If you happen to be dark-skinned, have an accent, try being a Mexican and being in the south somewhere. The way they treat you, I mean, the way the cops pull you over, try being black. That's even worse than being a Mexican, right? But the fact is that foreigners all have this inherent disadvantage. So they have to come here, they have to prove themselves. Yeah. And they have to work extremely hard, they have to be creative, they help each other. And this is why they, they end up succeeding. In fact, uh, if you look at the Indian community over here, 30 years ago, Huge. the proportion of Indian uh, founded startups in Silicon Valley was zero. People like me were considered beggar than snake charmers. We weren't CEOs. Today, 16% of the startups in Silicon Valley uh, are, have Indian CEOs or CTOs. That's mind-blowing considering that the Indians constitute 6% of the population over here. So you have a bunch of foreigners 
who get substandard education in a, in a poor country coming to Silicon Valley, the most competitive land on this planet, and now out-competing uh, people like Allison. How does that happen? Because they work very hard, they network with each other, and uh, they have um, uh, a burning desire to change the world. Okay. So, yeah, so, yeah, you're here. here. <laughs> So there's a really uh, there's another interesting element to to sort of the force of the immigrant entrepreneurs, and it, it's actually biological in nature. Um, Taryn Rose, for those of um, uh, the women in the audience who who love Taryn Rose shoes, Taryn Rose is a great entrepreneurial story. Uh, Vietnamese, uh, you know, came here as a child. Uh, her family had you know uh, very little money and, and landed in somewhere in, in the south and. And uh, she's still training as an orthopedic surgeon on her feet all day. She, um, she said, gosh, there's got to be you know, a way to have be shoes that are both fashionable and certainly more comfortable. Um, so she started this very successful uh, clothing line, uh, shoe line. And she's going on, she's doing other things. And one of the things that she talks about is um, there's actually data to support that immig you know, immigrants have a, tend to have a higher um, a profile in terms of, you know, it gets genetic, right? Where they, um, it takes three times as much to, st to stimulate them. Because, and, it's, and it has to do with everything. What do you that mean by stimulate? To, to just sort of, you know, get, you know, the uh, sort of going back to the basic fight or flight, right? And all those things that really, um, you know, get you going. really get us going. And it, and it goes back to, you know, some of the, um, you know, the situations that have caused many people's families to initially immigrate to the U.S., right? Because sometimes it's political, it's, you know, it's a whole range of situations. And, you know, that uh, does cause some changes that get passed on to that first generation, you know, kid who's, who's here that, and some of, the, you know, so that's certainly a component. So it's sort of and there's like, there's data. I mean, I saw the study. I've seen the table. Um, so uh, that's, you know, that's fascinating to see. And, and you know, I think the other piece is also you're starting to see, and, and it'd be interesting to understand how many of you in the audience are, are doing this. You know, there are um, folks who've gone, you know, have come and had great educations here in the U.S., come from other countries. And the, as they think about their startup, right, um, they may be going back home. Places like India, certainly, this is happening to take all of this and bring it back. And I, and I think that that's, that's certainly a, a hard truth that the U.S. Um, needs to and, and, and has to Get their been act together at. with visas and immigration. Right. And make it easier for the students we educate here to stay legally. Exactly. Absolutely. Did you have a, you, did you Yeah, have I wrote anything? a book about that. I know you did. <laughs> I know you wrote a book about it. That's wonderful. Um, do you have any other story, Vivek, about someone who came from overseas, made it? Besides that, I wrote a whole book about that. Angelica, you, you, can, you can't walk uh, a block here without bumping into someone who came from dire poverty and now became a multimillionaire uh, over a period of 20 or 30 years by working very hard in Silicon Valley. They're, they're all over the place. You know, even in this room, I'm sure there is extraordinary wealth, extraordinary success, great stories of hardship and making it big here. You know, to the credit of Silicon Valley, I'm very critical about uh, the boys' club in Silicon Valley and, and you uh, are. parts of it. But on the other hand, this is the most inclusive uh, place on this planet, despite everything. The fact is that if you defy the odds and, and work hard and succeed, you become accepted. Mm -hmm. And even the people I criticize embrace me. I'm speaking at the National Venture Capital Association this afternoon. I spoke there yesterday. I was delighted how open they were about it. I, we talked about the, the exclusion of women. And the, uh, the heads of the National Venture Capital Association said that we acknowledge that and we want to do everything we can to fix it. Well, so, as you did get a woman yeah. on the board of Twitter. Well, well which is one, which there was, is one there was step. a public outcry about that, but the fact is yeah. that that's the beauty of Silicon Valley, that it's open to criticism, Absolutely. that it embraces people who dissent, it embraces the dissenters. Mm -hmm. This is why all of these people can come here and succeed where they couldn't succeed anywhere else. Even in their home countries, they started defying, you know, uh, defying gravity, or if they just started standing up against uh, injustice, or if they started building technologies which threatened the incumbents, they could go to jail for that. Mm -hmm. Here, they uh, get the venture capitalists giving them money. 
So we're just going to touch for a minute on the on the issue of women because I know a lot of you are men. I'm just wondering, did Cheryl so Sandberg? Isn't it surprising that you're in Silicon Valley? You got three women and one man on a on a panel. You, you don't think that it was planned? It doesn't happen here. You don't think that was planned? <laughs> we also have mentors in our accelerator, and I think we have more women than men. But and actually, you, you'll no. get kicked out of here. I'm no, no. Actually, it wasn't planned. These are really smart people. We wanted to get them together. It, it wasn't really planned. But is there a growing, a changing? I mean, Alison, you, you've had it good. You might not you know, have had that fight. Did Sheryl Sandberg's lead-in change anything? Is it having an effect on other women entrepreneurs? I'm not sure it directly affects Silicon Valley. Obviously, it made it a big topic of conversation, exactly. which always helps, just making you know, women and business top of mind. I think that it gets well beyond Silicon Valley, and I think that that was our point. It's not just about pushing people to be entrepreneurs or be in tech, right. but it's pushing them to do whatever it is that they want to do, whether that be be a writer or a doctor. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. It's not just about tech. Mm -hmm. Anything? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that Allison mentioned earlier um, in terms of boards is really interesting to think about now for women founders, right, and CEOs of companies. And, and I had, um, you know, about, gosh, now about six, eight years ago, a woman who's gone on to um, very, sell her medical device company very successfully, just talk about the experience of, you know, first, and she was a first-time CEO, so engineer to, to founder CEO path. And, um, you know, going into her first board meeting where she was the only woman in the room and the CEO, you know, and you really think about the reality of that situation, and 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 so this is. But what this, difference did it make that she was a woman and they were men? Did did she feel that? I mean, did, did yeah. How? Well, it's you know, I mean, you're for, as a first time founder CEO. You know, regardless of gender, that's sort of an interesting. You know, there's 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 a lot going on there for you, right? As you're experiencing that, and and so then to to walk into that boardroom um, and realize that you're the only woman there. And then, you know, and that's about eight years ago. And it's, it, the, the point is that it's changing very slowly. And, and man, the board level is certainly critical, right? It's really important to have a strong board. So it's, uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, so the VEC's out there fighting the good fight, uh, and as are others, and uh, it's, it's important. It's not trivial, and it needs to, we need to, if anything, probably turn up the volume on the issue. See, I just want to disagree a little bit there. I mean, everyone has had different experiences, so I don't want to yeah. discredit your yeah. friend's experience by any means, but is you know, walking to the boardroom for the first time as a first-time CEO and founder intimidating? Yes, absolutely. Everything is when you're a first-time CEO and founder. But, you know, I'm the only woman on my board, and I've never felt you know, excluded against or like I'm fighting an uphill battle because of gender. It's simply because I'm a first time CEO and founder and there's a lot to get done. Yeah, so I can, I can actually add a, a, a little bit more color to this. It was sort, it's sort of fun. Um, you know, one of the examples is the, uh, the chairman of this board, you know, had a group every year and there, the way that they sort of bonded, you know, that he was involved, an investor involved in several companies and he would take the CEOs to a, um, uh, a golfing retreat every year, okay. and he was That's a great mentor to her, and, right. and she she wasn't invited. She's like, I don't golf. Oh my god! You know, so do I, do I have to take up golf lessons, like so I can go on the trip and Probably. have that great relationship with that guy? You know, so so it's just sort of that's that's sort of the reality. I I, um, I was giving a uh, a, a talk with uh, Tina Selig at Stanford years ago when I was at Stanford, and we were driving up together, and we met. Um, and, and saw this, this group of, of men meet at a you know, big Mercedes and they, at a park and ride place, and they were all putting their golf bags in the trunk of this Mercedes, and it was like a Tuesday at 10.30 a.m., and, and I just went, They're, that's like business for them. They're, you know, it's like, and I go, Tina, we don't do that. What, you know, do your friends, I mean, how does that happen? And so you know, we came up with some other ways to address that. Um, uh, that were very effective, but it, you know, these are just sort of the realities of how of that socialization, um, and those relationships and the communications that happen outside the boardroom, which are actually perhaps even more important than what happens inside the boardroom. So it's at that level that this stuff can can sort of creep in. 
So that yeah, gets, the, I'm that, sorry, go ahead. Let's get back to what I was saying earlier that you were disagreeing with, where you're going to hang out with people that have similarities to you, and that can be interest. And I think you know, gender is a great example of where you see different gender groups that may not be intentionally discriminating right. against, but more men yeah. play golf than women, and it's not necessarily you know, men play golf and women don't, but you're going to see those groups form simply because of interests. Yeah, let's uh, differentiate between startup boards, which is what we're talking about here, and corporate boards of public companies. That startup boards really is investors, friends, people who can network. It really, they really don't matter much. When you have public companies, then you have responsibility to your shareholders and the public. That's when you must have diversity. Mm -hmm, startup yeah. boards, I'm, you know, I, I, I typically just ignore them because it's uh, really a formality and it, it, make, it gives you the habit of, of feeling important by going to a board meeting. No one really takes a board seriously anyway. You're going to do what you're going to do. You're going to do all you can to survive. And that's what uh, happens in startups. I think differently about boards, by the way. <laughs> okay, we're, but like, when, one question short, and then I have a short round of short questions. Um, how, I, I work, I do a lot of pitch training with startups. How do you find a mentor? How do, how do you approach people that you think are fabulous and say, you know, I mean, they're not going to go up and say, Vivek, would you mentor me? But, and I'm not, I'm not talking about you here because you're all so incredibly busy. But how do people, uh, startups, find mentors that will really help them? In my opinion, the, by far the best mentors I've found have been other entrepreneurs that I've worked with. So again, I was very lucky to work for a few startups before starting my own company yeah. with very talented founders who have all been very generous of their time now. Two of them are actually angel investors in our company. Yay. So I think having Wonderful. the chance to work for a few startups, whether That's it's great. an internship or a first job after college, can help you find really talented people. And in my experience, you know, again, I've been fortunate, but I've seen all of them be willing to sort of pay it forward and help us out. Yeah, that's true. Sandy, just short, short sentence or two. Yeah, so the, the truth is that you need an array of mentors uh, because you're solving problems, every different problems every single day. So you need people who can help you um, with that uh, incredible range of problems. I know, but how do you approach them? So you're here, you're from India, from China, from Angelica, Germany, France. The likelihood of how them getting them? a Bill Draper or um, a Mark Zuckerberg or someone of that caliber to, to uh, be their mentor is zero because people Absolutely. don't have time. Yeah. What yeah. they should do is well, you have to realize is that everyone has strengths and weaknesses. People who have done it before have experience that's invaluable. Yeah. So you don't need to find uh, these celebrities. Uh, you need to find yeah. people who have been exactly. through the startup process before and realize that no, no, no yeah. one person has the answers you're looking for. Mm -hmm. They have their own experience, and they can provide you with a good frame of reference. They can provide you good, good feedback on what you're doing. But you have to ask a variety of people, just like Alison and Sandy said. Yeah. So get a, a variety of people helping you in different areas and expect that no one will give you the right answer, that you really are triangulating and trying to yeah. figure out what you can what learn from each you. person. Yeah. And then when you do approach uh, you know, famous people, don't ask them dumb questions, don't waste their time. Ask them specific questions. And in their area of expertise? In their area of expertise, and then form a relationship over time. I mean, I get hundreds of emails every day. I know you do. I respond to every one of them. I know you do. And what happens is that with some people, you form relationships. You wrote to me, God, how many years ago was that? Uh, Four, five? No, no, you wrote know. to me about seven, eight, was nine it, years yeah. ago. I wrote a book called They Made It, where I interviewed foreign-born executives, and Vivek had this fabulous report on, uh, on the percentage, 55% of all startups That was, were, must have been about 10 years ago, you wrote it? to me. I don't remember, but yeah. I wrote to you, yeah. And I responded to you, and exactly. then you wrote to me you know, six months later, yeah. and we stayed in touch. And then when I moved over here, then I met you, and exactly. uh, we became friends. Yeah. That's how the system works. So don't expect right. someone to go, out, to go to someone and say, will you be my mentor? The answer is no, I don't have time for you. Yeah. But if you ask them intelligent questions, most great people will give back. You'll find that there's a difference yeah. between great people and ordinary people, that people who truly deserve success are always, always willing to help other people. Yeah. They know that they nice. got there because yeah. of their humility. It wasn't, like, there's some one-trick ponies in Silicon Valley who just lucked out and they believe their own press. They believe that they're gods because they happen to be at the right place at the right time. Forget those people. They'll be arrogant as hell. Yeah. They'll give you the wrong advice. You don't want to know them. There are other people who've been through, you know, failure several times. They worked extremely hard. They had other people mentor them. They're grateful yeah. for the help that they got and now they want to pay it forward. That's so what they're the ones that's what to Thai approach. Thai does. Thai, yeah. Thai, it's all a lot of organizations. Thai, this, that's the beauty of Silicon Valley, yeah. that this place is rich in great people. So find those people and go to them tactically. Don't waste yeah. their time, but go to them for a specific advice that you need when really you need it. Really good advice. Yeah. All right, quick round. One, Tesla or hybrid Porsche? 
No, Tesla by it's, it's a spaceship yeah, that travels on He already owns a Tesla. Alison? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tesla or Porsche hybrid? I don't even own a car. <laughs> okay. What would you choose? Tesla. Tesla. Right, Tesla. Sandy? <laughs> Tesla or hybrid Porsche? <laughs> quick, this is a quick round. <laughs> flying car. Okay, no. flying car. Absolutely. Tesla. Wall Street Journal or New York Times? Um, both. Actually, I have to say Wall Street Journal because I write for the Wall Street Journal. Ah, so, interesting. Wall Street Journal it is. Okay, Allison? Uh, New York Times. Tandy? Both. Both, wow. Actually, Washington Post, number one. Well, of course, he writes for Washington Post, okay. Pando Daily or TechCrunch? No comment. No comment. I knew, I knew that was a difficult question. How about both, right? Both. Uh, Facebook or Twitter? I tweet and I just copy my tweets to Facebook. But Facebook is more useful than Twitter is. Okay. Allison? Uh, they both have their own advantages. I gotta oh, my both. God. They're wimping out yeah, Twitter. here. I'll say Twitter. All right. Twitter. Um, University Cafe or Coupa? <laughs> Koopa is cooler. Are they are they really different? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I don't Allison, think so. it's easier to get a table at University Cafe. Okay, exactly. University Cafe has better has better uh, shakes. I mean, better okay. uh, uh, smoothies. Right. Bitcoin or Square? Forget it. <laughs> Allison, They're both going to fail. <laughs> What's oh, gonna, wow. What's gonna, Bitcoin's going to fail? There'll, there'll be another generation that comes along, another technology which right. eclipses both of them Sandy? because they both have problems. Or Allison. I, mean, I have to say Square, I've never gotten into Bitcoin. Yeah, no, I'm just starting. You? I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think to Vivek's point, I don't know Bitcoin's the solution, but there's something that's going Digital to be. Digital currencies are going something to be the future, there. but we don't know which yeah. one it is, and okay. they're going to come out of nowhere. Yeah, so I, yeah. I think that's more uh, important. Now, a really that. tough question. Hey, I have, a, I have an article in the Wall Street Journal that uh, goes online this afternoon about that exact topic, about the disruption that's going to happen, where the competition comes from. So go to Wall Street Journal Accelerator's blog and look for my piece this afternoon. It addresses that issue. Great, great. Stanford or Berkeley? Good I went heart. to both, so I don't have to choose. Stanford, because I'm at Stanford now. Berkeley, before I used to be there. Exactly. Allison, of course, Stanford. Yeah, 13 Sandy. years Stanford. at Stanford. All right, we're all Stanford. Um, last ones. If you could have dinner with anyone, dead or alive. I know it's kind of a typical question. Who would you have it? You can have dinner with anyone, Vivek. I know I'll that. I'll have dinner with you, my friend. Oh, my God. I didn't pay him for this. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> But you're going to pay for it. I'm just kidding. I will cook. <laughs> I'll cook it. How's that? I'll pay. Don't worry. No, no, I'll cook. Allison? Uh, I'm most interested, actually, in political leaders. Someone sure. out of the box, like uh, maybe Kim Jong-il. Okay, That'd yeah. Very interesting. Pretty fascinating dinner, no? Oh, absolutely. I said dead or alive. <laughs> let, let, let him pay. Okay. Uh, exactly. Sandy? Uh, probably the Dalai Lama. Very interesting, yeah. I don't know if we have time for a question or two. Where is Consuelo? Oh, okay. quickly. No, uh, not Consuelo, sorry. Caroline, sorry, got nationalities are mixed up. Do you have a, just a quick question? Anyone burning question you want to ask? Yes, just shout. Oh, yeah, shoot, we forgot the word. Oh, my God, don't get, don't, get me started, go, don't get me started on that one. You have famous venture capitalists saying that people die in ideas after 35. Complete bullshit. I mean, the average age of a tech entrepreneur is 39. There are twice as many over 50 as under 25, twice as many over 60 as under 20 who are successful. So don't accept this nonsense yeah. that, uh, that uh, you are over the hill. In fact, if you are experienced, you're more likely to succeed. Now, it does help to have some young kids who have harebrained schemes in their heads, I mean, who have weird ideas working with you because they can think outside the box and they're not bound by the, uh, the challenges you faced and they're not as as hampered as they are by the experience. So team up with some young people, but they, we need old and young working together. I'll just add to that. One of the best teams I've ever worked on is when we had people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Go on. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's just awesome, right? And so, and that's the point. I think right now you need all of that. And we all learn from I each agree. other and, and the, diver, the, the interdisciplinary mix, that's, those, that's more important. I agree. Last one, sorry. Go ahead. Hi, um, Wait. we're combining our question here. And it has to be really fast and direct, okay. no long um, explanations. So question is, in terms of getting funding, so for me as a female entrepreneur, how can I get funding? And for him as a man with a wife and kids, how do you get funding? Don't even try, just go and bootstrap it however it takes, borrow, beg, borrow, steal from your friends, <laughs> raise some angel capital if you can, and when your company doesn't need funding anymore, the VCs will be begging <coughs> you to take their money. 
Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we have to stop. Thank you very much, Vivek, Allison, and Sandy. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention. That was awesome. Perfect. It was pretty well. Yeah. It's the panel. Yeah. Do you want to stay?